to And Here's Modi. Hello, everybody. Hi, Periel. Hi, hello. We have Rabbi Manus Friedman here with us today. Uh, wow, what a schut, what an honor, what a merit. That I don't know what I did to deserve such a guest. And yeah, to be you honest, you invited me. I, no, I don't know. Your your son reached out to us. All right. I, but um, I, when we did. When we began doing this podcast, maybe 15 episodes ago, and you and I made a list of who I wanted, your name was on that list. And it just happened that Hashem, God, put this together in the way, in the way it did. Those of you who don't know who Manus Friedman is, um, wow, I can't even begin. It's, um, he is a rabbi, a Chabad rabbi, an emissary of the Rebbe, which we're going to be talking about today. We need to do a lot of background on this. Yeah. This is not just, you know, funny enough, his nephew, uh, Chaim Marcus, says right away when you begin the podcast, let them know that this is Bob Dylan's rabbi. The man. <laughs> he says, just so you don't lose the audience, let them know. <laughs> and it's so funny. That's like the last thing I think about when I think of you. It's the last thing I think about. When, I, when, I, when the word Manus Friedman comes into my head, yes, there's the books you've written, but... The most insane thing in the world, if anybody ever gets to watch this on Google or on YouTube, when the Rebbe, when the Rebbe, um, and can, uh, Miles, can we put the Rebbe's picture up? When the Rebbe, when the Rebbe spoke, this is the Lubavitcher Rebbe, this is the man, this is a single man that probably, I think, had one of the biggest influences on the world, um, a single man. Um, he used to speak in the 80s. He used to do these, uh, a fabrengen, which means a get together and a rally. A rally. No, wow, wow, that's not a good word. <laughs> not today. That's not a good word. Rally is not a good word. He rallied the people up to go be emissaries and help other people. And, um, and he would come on. And this is in the 80s, before, before internet and Facebook. And he would just, they would do these insane, huge. Um, uh, gatherings in 770, the headquarters of the Lubavitch headquarters, and he would speak, and in Yiddish, and you would be the translator. And if you watch these videos, it is absolute insanity. Because it's not like you're translating um, English to, uh, you know, Yiddish to English. When the Rebbe spoke, he spoke in, in one line, there could be three different Talmudic tractates, a Hasidic uh, insight from Tanya, the main teachings of the Lubavitch world, and Yiddish, and it's in Hebrew, and it's in one line. And you can see the Rebbe is channeling this, and now you then have to translate that. And I've seen videos of you speaking about doing that, and how there was never like a button to make a, to make the speaker slow down. You talk, <laughs> he talked about when he went to, to, the, to a bookstore to, to buy a book on translating, they said to hit the button, let them know to slow down, um, read over the notes of, of whoever's speaking. There's no notes when the <laughs> Rebbe spoke. This is a complete channel um, of, of, of spirituality, of, of inspiration. And uh, that's what, so when I, when I think of you, that's the first thing that comes into my mind. Those were the laws or the conditions of the translators at the UN. Right. Which is the top of the field. Yeah. But they depended on a button to slow the speaker down, which <laughs> is going to do with the Rebbe, and with the notes that they're given in advance. So as it turns out, the Rebbe spoke in three languages, Yiddish, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Right. Because if he's quoting the Talmud, it's in Aramaic. Right. So all of that had to be. But the really uh, challenging thing was to make sure that the translation is not misleading or offensive because if you translate literally it can come out sounding very wrong very inappropriate so you can't have a literal word for word translation because you know different languages have different connotations right sure right. So sure it's but an so art it's really an it, art no, it's an, uh, but it's it's such an art it's like on another level when you watch it it's another level you know when i do my show and I go into, whenever I say something in Hebrew or in Yiddish, I right away learned how to translate it. Especially when I do the, the Hasidic character, I do Yoeli. 
I say it in Yiddish and I say it right away in English. And people like, it also reminds them that they actually know what the word means. You know, shikt, send. And like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 I know, I get it. This is on another level. We need to, I guess, right away speak about who the Rebbe is. And the, the, this is the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and this is um, the first time I saw the Rebbe was probably in the 80s. Well, I remember looking on, and, you know, flipping through the TV, and by say flipping, we had those cable boxes with the buttons on them. And you'd land on one, and all of a sudden you see the Rebbe speaking in front of thousands of Hasidim, and you were the translator. I didn't put that together at all. And, um, but it wasn't cable television. What was it? It was satellite uplink, downlink, or something. It was, <laughs> it was cutting edge. It was cutting it, 80s. You needed to, like, to get this channel, you needed to plug your toaster in, hold the wire hanger outside your, your house, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then you finally get the, it, it, it was, but, you, but it always somehow, I landed on it, and you couldn't turn it off. You couldn't turn it off. It was so mesmerizing. Uh, uh, it was, it was, I remember it. I remember seeing my parents, my parents had a big TV in the bedroom, so I always watched it there, and it was, it was mesmerizing. But the Rebbe is, how do you even define the Rebbe to, to, to my audience? Well, let's start with the, uh, with the broadcasts. Okay. Whatever it was called, uh, the satellite messages. Of all the rabbis in the world who are good speakers and personalities and charismatic, None of them go on television. Not one rabbi. Ever see a rabbi on television? No. Uh, if, well, later on, years later, yes, rabbis found their ways in. But this is in the 80s. This was just cutting edge. So of all the rabbis, the Lubavitcher Rebbe goes on television? I mean, that was mind-blowing. Mind this is the most, this is a Hasidic rabbi, and his, and this he created the, the concept of religious people communicating and dealing with people who weren't religious. Really? I didn't am know I right that. Or wrong? That, I am, didn't, I, am I right or wrong? That's so interesting. I had no idea that it's that was that, the case. The concept, now, now it's very cool to do kiruv, which means bringing people closer to the religion, and everybody set up their shop, and it's, uh, and it's, a, uh, it's tax deductible. But this was back then... <laughs> This is the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and his picture's on here, if anybody wants. And he, he, um, he the Rebbe uh, insists, don't all sit in Brooklyn with me. Go out to the world. And you went out. Originally, you began, um, you were in uh, St. Um, well, I mean, St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul. And you built a, a yeshiva for women, which, yes. which, was, which was also cutting edge. Yes. Yes, you were cutting edge. He's, he's sitting here all humble, but this is a huge. I'm. I'm. No, Leo, tell him I've been a mess since uh, you know <laughs> since we booked you. I'm like, what am I gonna do with Manus Friedman? Been so excited. Um, I remember when when you you wrote a book called um, "Doesn't Anybody Blush Anymore." This was when I was in college, and I loved it. And this is when I was starting my Chabad experience. I was going to a, a Lubavitch yeshiva that was in Boston, and I was going to Rabbi Posner's Chabad house, which is where I met, which is also where I met your, your nephew, Chaim Marcus. And you had this book, and I thought this book was great, and I handed it to my social, my, uh, not psychi psychology teacher, social something, and the woman went crazy. She goes, this is crazy, this is not right. This is not, ah. She had her whole problems with it. It, it, it cost me getting an A in the class, <laughs> your book. But I thought it was an amazing book at the time. Um, anyway, I don't, back t t to the Rebbe for a second. We have to just go back to this. Um, so let me just tell you one little incident, right? Okay. I was on a radio uh, talk show in Canada. Mm -hmm. And the host was a nice Jewish boy, the, child of a survivor. Okay. And out of nowhere, we were talking about the book. Doesn't anyone blush anymore? And he says, you know, I saw the Rebbe on television. He was just, you know, surfing with his, uh, with his remote control, and all of a sudden the Rebbe is there. He says, I just sat there. I couldn't, I couldn't change it. And I just sat there and cried. I said, you cried? It was a happy occasion. They were celebrating. They were saying, everybody was in a good mood. What were you crying about? 
He says, it's the first time I saw a Jew completely comfortable in his skin. It made me cry. Here's the Rebbe speaking in Yiddish, no apologies, for, you know, right. no attempt at, you know, sweetening or, or, or adjusting or making it more palatable. No, this is Judaism, and you're going to love it. And they do. And the people who were listening to those, they were six times a year for about eight years. The places this ended up, a Jewish guy on a battleship, an American battleship out in Greenland. Wow. Called up because there was a number on the screen you could call. Yep. To ask, what is this? <laughs> anyway, this guy called up and he said, I'm alone here on this ship with, I don't know, thousands of sailors. And, and we were surfing and we came across this and everybody wanted to watch it. And I was so proud because I was the Jew in the group, you know. So a monk, a Buddhist monk called from Tibet wow. to say, I didn't know Judaism had a philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> We're a well-kept secret. That's it's incredible. A, it's incredible. And, you know, every day I put on tefillin. I, we've, we've, we've discussed this, so we're good, right? Yeah, yeah well, we, we, you might want to fill the people ph- in phylacteries, in case. The, the leather band around with the blessing on the arm and the head, and the blessing's main thing is that we are one. Everybody's one, and also it's a it's the form of restriction. What, whatever your reason for putting on tefillin is to them. And I always do my meditation before I daven, and I always invite the Rebbe into my life. And I say the Rebbe... It's the concept of helping others. So whatever I'm doing today, let it be to help somebody else. And the Rebbe, people don't know. I mean, people know or don't know. It's years now since he's passed away. There's a generation that grew up without him. When I was in Boston University, we drove down a lot. The rabbi was just like, hey, this is happening. Let's just get in the car. And we would just drive for four hours and get to the Rebbe, and we would get dollars, or we would get um, the sikhs, the printed out things that were going on. This is in the 90, 90, 1990, 90, 89 to 92. And um, now people don't, don't, don't have a, to see him physically. It's people like you who has to bring the Rebbe to, to and it must be much harder for you with your congregations to, to to actually um, explain the Rebbe, is it not? To not, not, not? Not to be able to bring your congregants or your followers to, the, to see the Rebbe. We have to bring the Rebbe alive through his teachings and through his message. But it's amazing how the younger generation, who never saw the Rebbe, as you say, and yet they are so devoted to his mission they will go to the farthest corner of the world, leave their family, leave the comforts of Jewish community, kosher food availability, go out to places in Siberia, in Vietnam, and, and just do what the Rebbe asked, which is, since the Rebbe passed away, the number of emissaries tripled. When he says emissaries, he means people who opened up Chabad houses. Right. Like a synagogue. Okay. A synagogue that sometimes has a day school a part of it. Sometimes has a, a they 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 go from a small house. It could be a chabad house to a center. I've performed in all of them. I always say that I've been to more chabad houses than Rabbi um, <laughs> uh, Katharsky. <laughs> I've been to my. He's the he's. I don't know what his title is, and I don't want to say it, whatever it is. But I've been to more chabad houses than Rabbi Katharsky performing there. You know, it's hysterical. and there and it's insane because you have like the different types of Chabad rabbis. You have old school. You have Rabbi Friedman, period. Right, that's his name. The, they go by the last name, and they wear usually they wear a suit that's a a size or two too big for them. A big hat. The beard's all blah. You go. Here you go. And then you have the younger generation. They're kids, 
and they go by R- R- Rabbi Zalman, Rabbi Mendi. They take the last name out. They figure it's much easier to go Zalman or Mendi than Rabbi Huchenberg, you know? And they and they're younger and their suits are tight and they connect to they connect to their congregation on such a level. Not just the rabbi, his wife. The wives of these rabbis are next level they are so warm and 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 inviting and you see the kids and you're seeing judaism you're seeing hamish you're seeing the definition of the word hamish and they connect to their communities on every level from the little chabad houses to the 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 dissenters to the it's 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 insane and this is one man this is one man that made right so how did he how did he become like the rebbe like and how come there was he created the concept of having a Chabad house and recreating that all over the world. That was his idea. That was his vision. Can you explain a little bit? Okay, so let's back up a little. Good. There are seven generations of Chabad teachings, Chabad philosophy. Okay. Started in Russia in a little town called Lubavitch. Wow, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and Lubavitch literally means the village of love. Wow. Luba is love. Wow. So it's like Philadelphia. <laughs> 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 so um, seven generations and pretty much a dynasty because they were all Schneersons. In fact, the first Chabad Rebbe, his name was Schneer. Schneier Zalman. Mm-hmm. That's his first name. When they started using family names, they were first Schneeri and then Schneier son, kind of a Germanic. But that's the that's name that, that stuck. Schneier. And when was this? How far back are we talking? We're talking 200 years ago. Okay. So in history, it's relatively recent. Absolutely. So the philosophy that was a very profound, very um, very personal gr- development and growth in refinement, in devotion, in kindness, in truthfulness. But eventually it turned outward. Take all of those qualities and deliver it to somebody else. In Russia, in Europe, it was a little limited. I, you know. Yeah. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to hear from the Jews. Yeah. Like, when did you dare to speak up? Right. You had to be careful, particularly under communism. But once we came to America, the amazing thing is the immediate transformation. We were European until now. No more. We're American. And that whole posture changed. You stand up tall, Mm -hmm. you go public, you tell the world what you're all about overnight. Where America now, all the old habits are gone. Very few people could make that. And without compromise. There was no compromise in your mitzvah, in your Judaism, in your commandments. But the style, the personality, the... So the reason the previous Rebbe came to America, he could have gone to Israel in 1940. Right. The reason he came to America is because America was the antidote to the oppression of Europe. Mm. In Europe, we were so parochial. We were so ghettoized, shtetl life. You couldn't think beyond the Jewish community, beyond your own Jewish community. And we needed to heal from that. America was so cosmopolitan, so open, so free. We needed that. Yeah. Other than that, no thank you. you know, don't give us your, your lifestyle or your philosophy. But that, that worldliness, yeah. the ability to think global, and that's what made the Rebbe different from any other holy person, from any other rabbi or rebbe. Mm-hmm. He, th- he was a global thinker. That's Everything, incredible. Every word, every act had to affect the world. 
Yes. Not Brooklyn. And <laughs> and there are amazing stories. Every rabbi, like uh, Rabbi Friedman, ha- has insane stories. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, wow, the things that happened with the Rebbe. And then you, you had this thing called Yechidus, where you were one-on-one with the rabbi, with, with the Rebbe. And then, obviously, everybody wanted to be with him. So uh, please correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. He had he used to give out dollars, right? He You would line up around 770. And What's hours. 770? 770 is the headquarters. 770 Eastern Parkway, which is the headquarters of the, the Lubavitch the Lubavitch Center. Okay. And um, and he lived there. Um, uh, he, he lived there. And um, on Sundays, you'd line up, rain, shine, and people line for hours, and he would give you a dollar. He would give you a dollar, and the purpose of giving the dollar was to, um, and let me take my one of my dollars out of my back of my phone here. How many dollars do you have? I have about 20. Um, You're really stacking those up, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you get a dollar, and um, and the purpose of getting the dollar, and correct me if I'm wrong always, but it's to two Jews are meeting or two people are meeting. Right away, let's figure out how to help somebody else. So here's a dollar. Go give it to somebody else. So you kept the dollar from the Rebbe, and you gave a dollar to somebody else, a charity. And there were plenty of opportunities right when you walked out. Plenty of people asking for a dollar. What does it say? First of all, that's a beautiful concept. Second of all, what does it say? Can you show that to the screen too? Uh, yeah, I can definitely show you what it, I can't really read it right now because I have my glasses on me, but Rabbi? A dollar for success from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Okay, if it's in Hebrew though. It's in Hebrew. Yeah, dollar, shel bracha, v'atzlacha, me'et, uh, and there's his dollar. And believe it or not, Leo, our producer, has a dollar in his, look, Leo has a dollar as well. No, so this, so this reminds you just, just to help other people. Literally, it reminds you just you're having a bad day. You're, you're getting on stage. It's not about you and your ego. There's somebody out there that needs a laugh. Someone just found out that somebody in the family's not well, or someone's going through it, and you're about to deliver an hour and 10 minutes of comedy to just relieve them to it. That's what it's about. It's not about you being a star. It's not about you being, you know, uh, booked in this theater. It's about helping others. And that's just the biggest concept of the Rebbe. And I try, I, I, I hope I succeed, but I try. It just changes your life. So I have two questions. One of them is, and this might be a very Jewish question. Wh- I mean, it sounds like he was giving away like millions of dollars by the end of all this. Where is all of this? I mean, was this like money that was donated? Like you're just standing there giving away like tens of thousands of dollars every yes. single day? Every Yes. yes. People who, I'm, I don't know where he got the dollars, but the Rebbe gave out blessings to people who then made millions and millions of dollars. I don't think... I, I, where did the dollars come from? I mean, it's an interesting, like, is there a room <laughs> just filled with, like, dollar bills? In the basement, they <laughs> had this printing press. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they still, it's still there. Because right he here. knew nobody was going to actually try to use them, right? So it's okay. That's yeah. funny. Yes, it's yeah. true. No one was going to use them. No, it was all donated. Okay, that's, that's incredible, too. So it was already a charitable donation. The Rebbe could have given it away himself, but he wanted to spread it out so that everybody got into the act of charity. Charity was a big, big deal with the Rebbe. So do you think that this has sort of this like really incredibly beautiful, profound um, philosophy or way of being, has this infiltrated like other sorts of Judaism? Like I know Tzedakah is like a big thing always for any being Jewish. But I feel like this isn't like something really that's talked about so much in, I don't know, maybe conservative Judaism or reform Judaism as like the center stone of what we're supposed to be doing as Jews. No, there is a lot of charity, a lot of tzedakah. Yes. Jews who do nothing else Jewish will support Jewish causes Mm -hmm. and give a lot of charity, a lot of charity. But it's, it's on a big scale. Mm-hmm. It's an event. Yes. You write out a big check once a year, twice a year. 
The Nebbe made it a daily event. Yeah, it's incredible. I just gave $36 yesterday, in fact, to a synagogue on the Upper West Side. I'm no, supposed no. to do that anonymously, I know, but... Yeah. Anonymous. <laughs> so let me tell you a little story. I was in England, and they invited me to give the weekly thought on the BBC. Okay. Every Friday, I think it was, they have this five-minute thought. Some... some Lofty ideal, you know. So they took me down there to the studio, BBC, and this technician guy with the ponytail, hippie kind of guy, this is back then, he's, you know, making all the connections with the plugs, and, the, and he's muttering to himself. And he says, another bloke who thinks he can say something to 800 million people. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, he was jaded, like, yeah. what, what, you know, 800 million people listen to this. Wow. And you think you have something to say? Wow. So he was really, you know, like, you know. That week, the Rebbe had spoken publicly and had said that it would be a great idea that every institution, every company, every organization, when they pay their workers whatever, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, they should add a symbolic dollar suggesting that you got what you need. Think about someone who is still needy. Yep. Every organization, every school, every institution, every you're giving out a check, add a dollar. That's what I said. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards... This guy says, I think you've done it. That's great. No, it's, it's global. It's global. It's universal. And, it's and I'm going to talk about, and you know, you're just saying about Zedaka and helping, and, and in your new book, uh, Creating a Life That Matters, up front you speak about the reason the Jews have survived this long is because we do help each other. And the reason this podcast is called And Here's Modi is because I'm usually performing at an event where there's some tragedy or they're raising money for something depressing <laughs> and the woman comes on and here's Modi. And so that's, you know, I've performed at organizations that help women uh, with in vitro that they need, uh, yeshivas for kids with no money, people who are starving, people who are in jails, people who are in the most dire situations and Jewish and not and Hatzalah, which I can never st I can never speak enough about and Chabad and uh, Bikr Cholim, the, the people who bring food in the in the in the hospitals we talked about that we um, talked a lot about Bikr Cholim. And this is in, this is it we this you in your book you speak about this is the the reason of um, everything of everything, <laughs> right. of everything, yeah. So let me share. Let me share that idea with. Please. It's 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 a it's a life changing concept. Mark Twain, mm -hmm. in his famous article about the Jewish people. Yes. Other nations came and made a vast noise, and they are gone, lost in the backwaters of history, but the Jew is still here, showing no signs of infirmity. <laughs> it's insane. It's amazing. Which, which is a nice way of saying they're still making trouble. <laughs> Good trouble. So what is the secret, he says? Like, what is the secret to their longevity? I'll tell you what the secret is. We, we are both existing and living. Because when God created the world, he brought into existence things that didn't exist. So he gave it existence, but then he also gave it life. So everything in the world exists and lives. Fire, water, stones, everything. Everything exists by occupying space. That's the definition of existence. To be or not to be is to take up space or not take up space. So fire takes up space, air takes up space, stones take up space. Even thoughts, a thought in your mind takes up space. It doesn't allow another thought into that same space. You can't think two thoughts at the same time. 
because your mind is preoccupied, the space. An emotion in the heart takes up space. The heart is full. So everything exists by the same definition, occupies its space. But then also everything has a life. There's a life of fire, a life of water, a life of stones. And there they're not the same. The life of fire is what it produces, what it contributes, the difference that it makes. What is, what is it provides light, warmth, and other goodies. Water has a different life. It provides growth, keeps things cool, makes things stick. A stone has a life. What does it provide? Stability. A house made out of stone is more stable than a house made out of straw. Yes. We know that from non-kosher sources, <laughs> from, from, from the three little pigs. So everything has a life and an existence. The other nations that made a vast noise, they were de dedicated, devoted to their existence. They wanted to guarantee their continued existence. Yeah. So they built these huge cities and they amassed this great fortune. Empires. Empires so that the sun will not set on their empire. Jewish history was a little different. Before the Jews entered the promised land, Moses gave them a little pep talk. And what he said was, don't get too comfortable because <laughs> it's not going to last very long. <laughs> right? You read it. Yeah. it you're going to get thrown out of the land. Uh -huh. You will be dispersed all over the world where you will not be welcome. You're not going to know today what tomorrow will bring. In the evening, you won't know what you're going to eat in the morning. And in the morning, you don't know where you're going to be in the evening. And you're going to go crazy from the suffering and from the horrors and from... The Is that Moses or Jackie Mason? <laughs> you're, you're, you're delivering it like Jackie Mason. They sounded alike. They sounded alike. <laughs> The be by the way, the be some of the best comedy, if you read the Torah in certain ways, it, there's very funny ways. Really? That you, yes. When they took him out of Egypt and they said, to, this is where you brought us to die? Th we couldn't die in Egypt? Over here you brought us to die? <laughs> it's, I mean, obviously. You just add that tone and it's yeah. a comedy. Yeah. And it's become, yeah. So the people must have said, uh, is there a point to this? Like, what are you, right. what are you telling us? Moses said, what I'm telling you is, your existence is never going to be great. So instead of focusing on existing, focus on life. What you're going to have is not going to be exciting, but what you can give is everything. Wow. So there's existing and there's living. Some people are dedicated to their existence. It's dangerous. If you're dedicated to life, You'll outsurvive everything. Wow, right? that's a it's a, it's a huge. Give you an example. It's a huge. An example. Teenagers are angry. You got to wonder what they're angry about. They got no bills. <laughs> they got no mortgage to pay. They have no. What are they angry about? Well, if you ask them, they'll tell you they're angry because my mother ruined my life, my whole life. Yeah. That's very sad because it's not true. Number one, you cannot ruin life. Life means the opportunity to make a difference. How can you ruin that? You're in jail? Well, do some good there. You're in exile? Well, what can you contribute to the country you're in? Wherever you are, you can make a difference. You can't ruin that. You can ruin an existence. You know, I have a room to myself, and then somebody moves in on my space. You ruined my existence. To exist, I need money. I need food. I need shelter. You take away my money, you're harming my existence. So the teenager who is angry because her mother ruined her life doesn't know what life is. Right. Your mother can interfere with your existence and has a right to. Yeah. Like the teenager who said, I'm angry at my mother. She went into my room. Said, your room? Right. How did it become your room? It's your space? Not really. 
Your mother allows you to use that space, but it's her space. Right. So, yeah, she can ruin your existence, but you can't ruin life. So if a teenager understood there's a difference between existence and life, they wouldn't be so angry. And this is all in, in your book. And I, I read the first, the first uh, part of the book, and that was right there up front, very clearly and very... So the punchline of it is, you need love, nobody loves you, so what? You have love, use it. It's not meant for you. You know, this whole pop psychology, you got to love yourself, you got to validate yourself, you have to give yourself a good self-image. No, you don't. Hmm. If you have love, it was not meant for you. Just like speech. You're capable of speaking, so you talk to yourself, they take you away. <laughs> it was not meant for you. You have love and you're giving it to yourself? That's not healthy, it's not normal, it's not. Love is what you have to give. The same with, with knowledge. You have knowledge and it's for you. But by the Rebbe, th there was nothing that belonged to him, nothing. Yeah. He had a pair of tefillin, you mentioned tefillin. That was his only possession. The house was not his, the car was not his, his information was not his. His kindness was not his. Nothing was for me. It was all to give, to make a difference. To live fully means you're making a difference. You still so, need to be able to love yourself. You need to be able you to, do to have yourself. respect for yourself, and, and then you can give that. You, you, you uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you don't love yourself but you and have do, a respect. You do love yourself. Some people don't. Oh, they love themselves so much they want to commit suicide. No, yes. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to get that. But there's people who don't have, um, who don't have. Listen, when I began to respect myself more and know that I'm more of a channel, I was able to do uh, you. But you need to have respect for yourself and know that you yourself only are only so that you can give it away. Yes, yes, you can give. Like I said before, when we began, you, you get on stage, you're, you're there to give it away. It's not mm -hmm. your, mm -hmm. you know. It's funny when I get a clip, when I get a clip of some new joke, I'm like, I don't want to release this now because then when I get on stage, they've already heard it and but like, just release it, let it go. Unfortunately, the education that children get today, it's all about existing, nothing about life. A hundred percent. And it's making them crazy. Mm -hmm. It is not a healthy way to live. It's not, no. The, the, the it's like being constipated all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it, it isn't. And, and books like yours are, are life-changing. I, I can't express, explain to you enough the amount of people. First of all, he's one of the most watched rabbis on YouTube. And that says a lot. And as a huge fan base and people whose lives that he has changed. Um, you, you, I, I've learned many things from you. I, my life was changed from a book similar to yours. It was actually written by a person who wasn't Jewish. But it organized all my Jewish teachings into a form where I can use it. That's, it's, these types of books are so important to read. Even if you get the whole book or you take a nugget of information out of it, it's just um, it's, it's so important. Because Torah itself, when you learn it, it's in Hebrew, Aramaic, it's in languages, Rashi script, and all this other stuff. And you need to be able to understand it. And uh, Rabbi Friedman is one of the most uh, w w people who's got the, that, the talent to explain it. Am I right? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not. <laughs> but it all, it all goes back to our relationship with God. If that relationship is healthy, all your relationships will be healthy. If that one is not healthy, the others are probably not going to be healthy either. What does that mean, having a healthy relationship with God, though? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pop in before your question, and it's also, what is God? Your relationship with God, it, it, and I, I, it took a long time for me to understand that, that God is not a man with a white beard in a black hat upstairs saying, you did good, you did bad. God is Shema Israel, 
Adoshem Elokeinu, Adoshem Echad. Listen, Israel, and Israel is not being just Jews. It's 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 a concept of people who think in a certain way. God is is one. So there's not one God. There's God is oneness. And when you understand that, I, I'm I, maybe this is not your philosophy, but this is something that gets me out of bed in the day. I was pretty into the long white beard and the black hat. Yeah, you messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> it works for you. It makes you very godly. The white beard, <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it's, so your relationship with God is what's important, yes. And that's, that means your relationship, so to me, that's your relationship with everybody. So here's, here's the <coughs> mind-boggling concept. God is the creator, which means God is the original substance that existed always, and from that original existence, everything else devolved. Now, according to the evolution, it was a subatomic particle. But there had to be something, right? Right. There was that original substance. What the Torah tells us is that that original substance was not content to be without you. That's God. Okay. That's deep. And he actually said it. And it's quoted in the Torah. God says it is not good to be alone. That explains everything. God was alone. Perfect, but alone. And there's nothing good about perfection. Mm. Mm. Isn't that a, a mind-blowing concept? Yes. All right, fine, you're perfect. Thank you're you. completely self-sufficient. You're capable of everything. You know everything. You are almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing. Yeah, so? Everybody says, oh, wow. What? No, what? What? So what? You're eternal. You're infinite. You're, yeah, and so what's new? Nothing. <laughs> so where are you going? Nowhere. So what's going to happen? No. What, what is good about perfection? Nothing. So God says, it is not good to be alone, even if you're God and perfect. That's why I created you, to not be alone. And to not be perfect. Huh? And to not be perfect. That's to be perfect and humble. Because I'm not enough, but with you I'm okay? How humble is that? So, that's the most essential, the most organic part of God, that he doesn't want to be alone. The rest is commentary. No. But here's a good example. According to Jewish law, you're not allowed to pray in a synagogue sitting next to your wife. A man is not allowed to pray with anybody. You're going to get her started right now. No, go no, no. Go, go for it. Go for it right now. Okay. On. Now, I understand not sitting next to other women. Mm -hmm. All right. It's distraction. You want to pay attention to them. But your own wife. You can't pray sitting next to your own wife. So you ask traditional thinkers, and they'll say, well, you know, you can be distracted by your wife too, you know. And so you're not allowed to pray to God sitting next to your wife because you might get distracted by your wife. Does that sound like God to you? God is jealous of your attention? If you're distracted by your wife, he's offended? Okay. No. After all, he invented marriage. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he sits in heaven making matches. So he matched you up with your wife and got you married to her, and now he's jealous that you're paying it? No. It's the exact opposite. God is upset if you're sitting next to your wife but talking to him. When you're sitting next to your wife, you pay attention to your wife. You'll pray to me in your free time. You like that. I love it. Wait, how, are you, how are you doing with it? How are you doing with it? I thought you weren't allowed to sit next to your wife because she was going to nag you about something. No, well, that's now you got, now you um, got a really no, that's beautiful... That's at home. <laughs> <laughs> but now you get, that's a beautiful it, it, concept. It, it, it is a beautiful concept. It's a beautiful concept. I mean, I... 
keep keep going. I'm listening. Again, the whole idea is you're you're in this world to make a contribution and to make a difference. Don't talk to me, God says. I didn't send you down to earth to talk to me when you're sitting next to your wife who needs your attention, right? who deserves your attention. So do what is best for the world, and I will be, God is saying, do what is best for people, for the world, for the creation, and that I will be perfectly happy with that. Beautiful. I, I, Rabbi Manus Friedman is known as one of the most original thinkers in Jewish, even though he's quoting from, from all the sources of Jewish teachings, he is, uh, people just always consider him one of the original thinkers. Um, um, I, I once listened to you, I went to hear you speak, and it was right when cell phones and apps and dating apps were starting and texting was huge. And um, it was a it was a small room, but it was intimate. And you were, and a lot of it was all singles, and you were telling them how texting and communicating through machines was it's a way to to disseminate information. It's not a way to communicate. It was a chunk of information like that stuck with me. You yeah. know how many years ago? Yeah. And I don't know. And, you know, Leo, I I never. I, my, when people text me, it's yes, no, here, there, done, da, address, move, bon. Not, I'm really not happy with the way this turned out, and I don't want to, no, 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 no. Never, and that, yeah. I learned from you. That, I learned from you. If something happened, because are you sure you're okay? Boom, call. Yes. Uh, let me speak to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was something, that was a nugget I picked up from Rabbi Friedman early when all of that texting and communicating through, through non-humane ways began. And so I thank you for that. I think I remember one of the things I mentioned then is that some guy said to his old-fashioned mother, the Internet can answer any question. Anything you want to know, you go on the Internet and it'll answer your question. And she says, no, it can't be. He said, no, I'm telling you. Ask anything. The information is there. You'll get an answer to your question. She says, no, it can't be. He says, go ahead, ask me a question. She says, how was Aunt Sadie feeling today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Ask Alexa? Uh -uh. No idea. <laughs> See, it's not meant for interpersonal communication. Right. I agree. It's meant for the sharing of information, and it hasn't changed all these years. A hundred percent. That's really true. People no. really miss that. So I'm telling you, read Rabbi Friedman's books. They, they, even if you don't go with the whole philosophy, there will be things that will change your life. Um, so I want to talk about also your family, your immediate family, which is, uh, wow, wow, I can't explain it to you. So Rabbi Friedman, first of all, Rabbi Friedman, if when you think Lubavitch and Chabad, the first thing that pops in your mind is Rabbi Friedman. But... Your family actually was not from, was not a Lubavitch Hasidic descent. And let me tell you when I found that out. I think it was 1993. I was in, um, I was staying at, at, at your bro brother's house. Now, you have a brother and his wife, Bracha, who is, the, I can't explain to you that their house, it's two levels, well, it's like th three levels. On top lived your mother of sacred memory and sweetness and may her soul be in the best place in the world. Under that was your brother's home and under that was a dormitory. From what I remember, a it was a hotel. <laughs> it was a basement with rooms, just rooms, 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 rooms everywhere. And whoever was staying in Crown Heights for Shabbat or whatever, they, if you were connected enough to them, you had a room. So I was in one room, you were in the other room. It was, you know, it was whoever else from the family coming from all over the world were in that room. And I was there for Sukkot, the holiday where we sit in the shack and all that. Um, and Lubavitch are very strict. You cannot eat when there's, when there's a cover over the sukkah. The sukkah is, has to have um, schach, which is bamboo. Any, any plant. Any plant covering. So there's holes that you see the sky. And now, other Hasidim, if it's raining, they can cover or go inside. So your, 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 th their house on, on the top floor had a rolling thing. 
now your father who sat with a fur hat, which is not traditional for Chabad. So here we, here we are sitting at the sukkah, and it's pouring. Not raining, pouring. Pouring. And your father says, mm, you know, put the, put the roof on. And now the soup comes on. And I don't have to tell you how much I love soup. Leo, <laughs> tell the rabbi how much I love soup. And if it's warm, it's the next level for me. A warm, good, and the soup landed on the table. And it, the rain was insane. And Avram was there. Avram Fried was there. And now Avram Fried and all the other grandkids that were there, were there, and your father is sitting there with the cover, and he's eating the soup. And I'm, so what do I do? <laughs> I, 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 I hold by whoever's house it is. And I had the soup with him. But that's when I found out that your original family was not, um, your original descendants is not Chabad. And yet, I, I, even though in my, in my world, every Jew is Chabad. And I can't, when I see a Jew, I just know this is also a part of Chabad. You, know, you, could, you determined all of this because of the hat? No, they told me that the reason why he's eating is because he's from a different Hasidic a tradition where the, if it's raining, you can eat with a cover or go inside, but Chabad doesn't. But um, that was just... Uh, so I'll tell you, what really um, sold me or attracted me yeah. was, this is 1950, right? Or the 50s. 1950s, not when I was having soup in your father's house. People, I'm not <laughs> that old, okay? I'm just so... Weird. <laughs> and the mood in the Jewish community was post-Holocaust. It was very depressed, negative, pessimistic, terribly. They were holding on to the last vestiges, you know, the last of the Mohicans. We are going to be the last observant, religious, uh, practicing Jews because in America, it's all over. Mm -hmm. My grandfather begged me to at least, at least observe Shabbat. <laughs> Because you know, he, he wouldn't ask, you know, can't, can't ask for too much, can't expect too much. Then I walked down the street to Eastern Parkway, because we lived in, in Crown Heights. Mm -hmm. I walked down the street to Eastern Parkway, and there's a Rebbe, the youngest Rebbe in, 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 in the world probably, and he's saying, change the world. We got to change the world. So <laughs> the world that just devastated you and, and yeah. We have the Torah, and with Torah, we can change the world. You know, to a teenager, that's, that's heady stuff. Yeah. I said, this is it. I'm in. Yeah, let's change the world. Mm -hmm. Get away from this depressing, pessimistic, uh, defeatist attitude. Look at this. We can change the world. Yeah. Coming after a Holocaust, that is sheer godliness, it's miraculous. How can you be not only optimistic about yourself, but that the whole world can change for the better? The world that just pulled off a Holocaust? And it was the whole world. No, we've got to change that world. Make it a godly place. How can you resist that? Yeah. It was really irresistible. That is miraculous. No. To was, witness, I mean, uh, as a kid, can you imagine? So that was how you met? That yeah. was how his country... I was 12 years old. Yeah. I said, wow, these guys are singing, they're dancing, they're building stuff. You know, there are events going on all hours of the night. That this place is alive. Yeah. It's, and, um, and so I'm going to con continue on with your family. So you, you, are you the oldest of your brothers, of your siblings? Yeah. Of the brothers. Of the brothers. Um, in the Jewish world, in the Orthodox Jewish world, there's this, the number one singer... Maybe one, one, the, one of the top singers is Avram Fried, and that's your youngest brother. And he, and now everybody in that family now is singing. There's the, you have your son, Benny Friedman, who is just insane. He's, I remember when he began, I remember in, in 2010 in LA watching him in one of his first weddings singing, and it was just an incredible, um, it was, and now he's just so strong and so good and such a, exudes such um, an energy. And I'll tell you a funny story about Benny. You have but a picture of him? Oh. You can pull up? Um, that, but uh, 50 years younger. Um, 
He um, it, he kind of looks like you when you were doing the, the translation to uh, to the Rebbe's uh, speeches, but I remember when he was looking for a wife, and we were having dinner somewhere in um, you know the story. We were having dinner somewhere in Pico Robertson area, and he was like he he'd gone on a few dates and something, and he was sitting there. It was like a little and he was sitting with a sweater almost like the one you're wearing now, and I said to him, Benny. Lose the sweater. <laughs> Ask him this. This is, and he goes, okay. He lost the sweater, and he told me a few weeks later he found it. I, I, I go. I hope you're not going on dates in that sweater. <laughs> that sweater is horrible. It was this cardigan that your your grandfather's grandfather would have, and so it's um. So Benny's in it. Benny Friedman is in it. And then now from uh, from your 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 sister, the Marcus family, you have um. Eighth Day, Bensi and Shmuley, Marcus, who are Eighth Day singers. They're Eighth Day is the name of the band, and they're amazing. If anybody's listening, Google them. And the youngest of that family, Ellie Marcus, who's such a talent. And um, and um, there's many more people from your family that are, um, singing-wise, that's it. But your brothers have all accomplished such amazing work through charities, through teachings, through, uh, they, I mean, I mean, this is about you today. But I had to say that the family is not just a regular family. It's a, it's, it's, it's on another level, on another other level. And they're all funny. And they're all hysterical. They all have a sense Benny, of humor. Benny gets up on stage, and he says, "I was born in Minnesota, but I'm not the only Jewish singer from Minnesota. There's also Bob Dylan." And between the two of us, we have sold millions of albums. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember one of the jokes That's I have hilarious. in my act. One of the jokes I have in my act was when when your mother passed away. H how old was she when she passed away? One hundred and one. Wow. One hundred and one. And I was sitting in in the house. I came to do a shiva call, and, and Avram Fried was there, and he was very. And he's the youngest son, and it's one hundred and one. But still, it's your mother. And he was very depressed, kind of, and very like just down and in zoning into it and somebody and the shiva and I always talk about this in my act how people ask the stupidest questions in a shiva and someone turned to him and asked him you know how did she pass away and then before he had a chance to to to, to answer I said her parachute didn't open <laughs> 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 what are you asking these stupid questions <laughs> and he laughed it's like you're laughing now and it was um, I, it was just um, it was a moment but uh I do want to. Uh, I do want to end with one thing that it's also you. You're also known as Bob Dylan's rabbi. And can you tell us the story of your connection with Bob Dylan? Um, Is this just a story you've told so many times you don't want to tell? No, it? on the contrary. Yeah, he really wants his privacy. Oh, okay. His, so his, I, his I, relationship to. To, to the Rebbe, to the Re I know you brought Rebbe. him to the Rebbe. That's more what I I don't want. I don't want to hear uh, his, his. He fell in love with the Rebbe. Yeah, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Okay. But he's a Minnesota boy, and he would come visit his mother regularly in Minnesota. So you know we would get together on Shabbos. And tell you one delicious story. In our, in our Chabad house, synagogue, mm -hmm. there is this family who are absolutely his biggest fans. Okay. They adore him. They worship him. They're not observant. So one year, they decided that the most meaningful way of spending Yom Kippur is to go up to Hibbing to look at Dylan's house where he grew up. Wow. That's about a three-hour drive. Wow. But their daughter, who had just come back from college, didn't want to do some more traveling. She decided, no, no, no I'm going to stay, and I'll just go to the Chabad. She walks in Yom Kippur morning, and she sits down right behind the woman's division thing, and right in front of her, on the other side of the, of the divide, is Bob Dylan. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> he was there the entire day. Wow. Wow. He fasted. He got called up to the Torah. And she couldn't wait for her family to come back. 
and say, oh, you went to look at his empty house? That's his He's right here. I was dominating with him. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> what a great story. That's what a great story. I, 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 can't, I can't thank you enough for coming. You're, you're in town, I'm assuming, because of the Chabad Kinus, which is the convention of all of the Chabad rabbis from all over the world. They come to New York once wow. a year. Once a year. I've had the opportunity of, of being there uh, twice. It is an energy that is unbelievable. You're in a room of people that their main goal is to help others. You're in the, it's an insane, um, it's, and people know each other, and, and they're all somehow related, and they're all, it's just a, and, and. But it's also a perfect opportunity for you to ask Rabbi Friedman. What? Your question. Oh, wow. I forgot. Uh, why do I keep forgetting? No, no, that's what I, that's, I that's the own, that's the main function I serve here. Wow. And Miles is laughing because he's <laughs> like, Modi is such an idiot. He keeps forgetting his one question. Everybody else in their podcast has, let's do this and let's do that. The little, I have one question. Who's your rabbi? I ask all my guests, who's your and then I tell them rabbi is your teacher, somebody who you go to for for I'm assuming your rabbi of is the is the Rebbe, but who would you go to now? Since you're probably somebody who, if I would ask this for millions of people, they would say, Rabbi, and Rabbi Friedman. Friedman right. Yeah, so it's like, so where do you we're go? So now we're <laughs> asking the rabbi who your rabbi is. Oh, well, sadly, the rabbi who I, who I considered my inspiration and my, my role model passed away this year, oh. a couple of months ago. What rabbi? Rabbi Yael Khan. Oh, wow, okay. He was the Rebbe's voice. He memorized everything the Rebbe said, recorded it, wrote it. And he was, he was an amazing human being. Wow. Wow. Did not belong in this generation. Wow. He was like from, and he passed away a couple of months ago. He was 90. Mm -hmm. His mind was as sharp. In fact, he was in pain and he refused to take medication because it made his mind a little fuzzy and he no, really? would not compromise his thinking. And he could sit and concentrate on a subject for hours. Wow. And that, oh, they, they did an x-ray. Not, not in the last days, but in, during his, you know, his medical care, they did an x-ray of his brain. Yes. And the doctor said, that's the brain of a 13-year-old. Wow. 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 Fresh. And he passed away. Yeah. I'm sorry. So now I got to look around because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting to be one of the elders. <laughs> Is that why you came here to the, to the convention? So you can, fi you can, you can interview rabbi. some people. <laughs> no, right now it's my peers. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, I, so, uh, besides, there's a new book, uh, Creating a Life That Matters, with Rabbi Friedman's uh, lit latest book, and I definitely encourage you to read um, the other ones. Um, they're not all as this thick. No. <laughs> they're not this thick. <laughs> the others and the, are and booklets the compared booklet, to this. Yeah, this, I needed a full Adderall to get through the first part of this. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I love you, but I, I took, it took a lot I, it, for me to... Is that on audio yet, or no? It's coming out. Uh, but so it's that's, also, when I, that's when I... It's not all one subject. No, I know. It was... It's kind of a manual. Of you can skip around very easily, which I like, but audio is when, when I'm driving from and to a gig, that's when I listen to this stuff. So there's... Education, raising children, there's marriage and relationships, there's life and death, and there's God. Yes. So whichever topic... And re relationships is kind of what people think your, the, your, your strength is in, is from what I... From, in, my, in my opinion. Because the previous two books yes, were on relationships. Exactly. And, and how do they... What? Well, and also Rifka Goldstein... Did all the work. She deserves a shout out here, I'm sure. Who's, yeah. Rifka, who's Rifka Goldstein? She's a woman uh, from China who converted to Judaism. Wow. She's a graduate of Harvard Divinity School, I think. Okay. 
And she just loved these ideas and spent three years gathering every tape I've ever made, every lecture I've ever given, and put it all together. And wow. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. So she changed her name to Rivka. Yeah. That's incredible. That's amazing. And she married a Goldstein from Minnesota. So Perfect. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So she got the full name. And to reach you, how would somebody, if somebody's listening to this and say, I want to connect to this rabbi on another level, is, uh, you, you have an Instagram account. You have, am what I, is, what is that? You, you, uh, you, do you know your Instagram account or no? <laughs> I know we have a site called it's good to know.org. Perfect. Perfect. It's, it's good to it's good to know.org. That's the best way to reach you. Yeah. Uh, please, please reach out to him. Please look at his videos. Watch the translating of the Rebbe speeches. It is, you, there's no way you were in your, well, you were in a zone. You were like, yeah. When I'm on stage and the, or this past weekend, uh, this past, what am I saying, weekend, this past. Uh, Yesterday. Two, yes, no, two days ago. I, beautiful theater, 500 people in Broward County. And it was lit. And you're in a zone, and you're in it. And I keep reminding myself, enjoy it, enjoy it. This is it. They're laughing. They're they're having the best time. Nothing. You, I'm in it. I'm in, you're in a zone, and this is just you know, you, the energy between you and the audience. I, I can't imagine what you're going through. Nothing. When you're translating this, uh, you have to see pictures blank. of him when he was the, blank. Yeah. Because if you stop to think, you fall, you're done. You, you're done. You fall behind. You're done. So it would just go in, you know, the expression, in one ear and out, out the, other. the other. No, it went in the air and out, out the, the mouth, mouth. And I don't know what I said. You have to you have to watch this. It's insane. Something else, all the glasses everybody was wearing back then are all back. Those square glasses. I just ordered a pair. Huh. There's a fashion moment here. Anyway, um, it's... Good to know. It's good to know. dot org. Please connect with the rabbi. Um, you have a birthday today or yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. Happy yeah. birthday! Thank you, you, you very have a much. show tonight. Not that this is going to air uh, a little later, but uh, I'll be at your show tonight. Yes, I'm a, so excited. I'm so excited too. Um, Modi underscore live on Instagram. ModiLive dot com shows coming up in Chicago. Skokie, the Yidden and Skokie. I'm doing a show for them on November 9th. A whole bunch of other dates are coming up. Um, LA shows are coming up. So look on my best thing always is Modi ModiLive dot com or the link in the bio at Modi underscore live. Uh, thank you for the sponsors, people that are are, are supporting us and contact us if you want to uh, we, if you want to sponsor anonymously or not, um, one of the one of the podcasts. And uh, Ra- Rabbi, I, I am I'm humbled. I am thankful, and I am so happy I was able to see you and have you here as a guest. That is so sweet of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>